pagi, Mr. Wee Chong, uh, CEO of UB Group. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Tachi Hao, Saudi Cup, Mabuhai. You want me to go on? No, okay. So I will just recap what we talked about this morning. ASEAN centrality and political stability are key ingredients for ASEAN to forge ahead. Now I'm going to ask and hopefully answer some difficult questions. ASEAN has a key mainstay export sectors, as you can see on the screen. These are the key sectors that ASEAN has to defend, but in order to forge ahead, you need a new paradigm of growth strategy. Palm oil, Malaysia and Indonesia, has to put that ESG element if you were to grow stronger. EV, Thailand and Indonesia has to work hand in hand. Unfortunately, our trade cycles are too dependent on China. Look at this cycle. We follow exactly where China is. The good news is that the contraction that we are seeing right now due to the impact of a tighter monetary policy is actually much less compared to the 2008 global financial crisis. And Chinese trade contraction has bottomed out, meaning that ASEAN is bound to have a stronger trade ahead. But again, as I mentioned, the old mainstay key sectoral exports need to be relooked with a new strategy. How about Indonesia? Indonesia, in my view, offers an unparalleled investment opportunities in two sides of a coin. Firstly, done right, structurally transformed, it will be the key manufacturing hub for the region. This has started since downstreaming, which we will talk more in great detail in first session, began in 2010. Look at that, contribution to the so-called refinery and basic metals to the overall manufacturing value added has increased since 2010, going faster in 2018 and unstoppable during COVID. This is where the turning point is very significant. Nickel value added, the ore exports only amounted to like 2 billion before we refine it. Now it is up to the tune of 30 billion. Imagine you replicate that for copper. June next year, there'll be a, probably more policy for downstreaming. Bauxite already started. So this is, to me, opportunity. Because the greater ecosystem that we are looking at is on the cleaner transportation. Now, I'm going to talk later at the end of it what are the challenges, but safe to say, done right, this unleashing of opportunity will be very powerful. Look at this, even during COVID, we have seen our commodity boom contributed to our overall export revenue more than the last boom in 2011. Very powerful. At the same time, it attracts the right kind of investment which is investment to base metals processing. This is huge opportunity. China is pursuing its EV strategy relentlessly despite domestic-driven issues of property sector. This is the one that they will push through, and Indonesia stands to be the beneficiary of that. Now, this chart is very important, both for policymakers and businesses. The volatility in rupiah is supposed to be one of the biggest factors that cause investors to probably always ask the question. Now, imagine if you draw the right investment and export the right value added. What you can see here is the concept in economics called basic balance, which is the summation of the current account position and the net FDI. If the sum of the two is neutral or positive, rupiah will be stable, 
as evident during the first boom in the year 2000 till 2011. Afterwards, the boom ended, and we didn't have enough policy to draw the right FDI features in the country. Rupiah depreciated almost 80% or more. But right now, it is back to a positive basic balances. So whatever weakness that we see in the rupiah is a reflection of a dollar move because Indonesia's external balance and position remains strong. Net FDI and current account surplus create an environment for the rupiah to remain quite stable. And in fact, for next year, we expect the rupiah to come back down to below 15,000. You need stability, not directional for investment in Indonesia, especially as foreign currency goes. Now, the second part of the coin, after being a strong manufacturing hub, Indonesia itself is a gateway to the strongest and biggest consumption market, especially so since COVID. COVID changed a lot of economic activities. Some temporary, some, in fact, most will be permanent. For example, when you travel out, you can't during COVID. You only watch via YouTube. Would you want to do that forever? I don't think so. But tuition, classes, lessons, to infiltrate and penetrate positively people in the remote area, this is powerful. And give you an opportunity to invest. Education business in Indonesia actually is a big deal. Plus the fact that the internet penetration is not too bad. About three quarters of us have it. But the problem remains on the rate of utilization. Yet, our productive age has increased from half into currently about 70% with a larger base. 50 years ago, our population is probably less than 200 million. Now, we have 280 million and about 70% is in the consumptive era. And this is the best of all. Amongst ASEAN, the proportion of us that age 35 and below is actually above the ASEAN average. Above means the runway for Indonesia to really unleash and unlock the economic consumption potentials remain strong. In the region, Thailand has already entered into its aging populations five or seven years ago. Singapore likewise, China too. Japan is an old story, which is currently probably facing a deflation issues. But Indonesia done right structurally and willingly, we can really monetize the second part of the unparalleled position. Now, what do we need to go forward to really unlock these two? In the current juncture, there are five elements. First, energy transition is key. You need energy to grow the economy. And that relates to my second point and in the first panel. The industrial downstreaming, whatever you want to call it, you need energy to power up. Number four, digital transformation, you need energy. A cleaner type, hopefully. And of course, we already have built the infrastructure right now, the roads, airports, and seaports. Now use it. You know, usually the inflation problem in Indonesia is due to the lack of infrastructure. Now we have it. So if your region is surplus in oranges or rice, for example, go and export it out from Sulawesi to Java, Kalimantan, the oranges to Java. We don't have to look too further away. Now, we have a better transportation connection and logistic. And finally, of course, we also look forward to the transition of the new capital. They will actually represent a more push towards equitable growth as well as centrality of Indonesia. Now, this second chart, I want you to pay attention because to surround all the energy transition and whatnot, 
one has to understand the energy consumption mix in this region. Look at Indonesia. We are still coal dependent, and the direction is red. We want it to be green, meaning you reduce it, you move it to the right column. But it's easier to be ideologically very keen versus the actual business implementation. So strike a balance. Look at the Latin American country, Colombia, Venezuela. They move to hydro, electric, wind turbine, and solar panel, right? China, China at least move a little bit, although they are the highest coal-based energy power generator. But ladies and gentlemen, today, and as the first session and second goes, this actually represents challenges and opportunities. You invest it right, you'll reap it. And with the longer runway, we believe that actually for Indonesia, if you've been a faithful follower of our economic outlook, we've outlined many strategies of reform for the government. Today, we are focusing on two, which is the industrial downstreaming, the value-added manufacturing growth, and secondly, to unleash the digital economy through digital transformation. And it is not impossible for Indonesia with the reform trajectory to reach seven or more in terms of economic growth. And we believe, done right again, for structural transformation, Indonesia will reach a higher, more quality, and more sustainable economic growth. Thank you very much.